So, the idea of Hilbert's Hotel is this. Hilbert owns a hotel and it's an infinitely large hotel. You can see that represented here. We have an infinite number of rooms, the hotel stretches all the way up to infinity, and each room is labelled with a successive natural number. So the first room is labelled room number one, the second room number two, the third three, then four, then five, and so on and so on and so on. And to start with, all the rooms in Hilbert's Hotel are not occupied, and we represent that here by showing them as shaded in grey. However, when Hilbert opens his magnificent hotel, one by one he gets more guests coming, and gradually he fills up the hotel until he gets to the point that every single room is occupied. He has an infinite number of guests occupying all infinity rooms, and we represent that here by shading in the rooms as green. However, what happens next, now that he's uh, fully occupied all infinity rooms, is that one more guest arrives at the door and says, is there any way you can make some room for me, please? And the manager has a think about this, um, but then the manager has an epiphany, and the manager issues a statement over the loudspeaker to all the guests in the hotel. And he says, attention please, every guest is required to move to the room which is one higher than the room they are currently in. So if you're in room number one, you have to go to room number two. If you're in room number two, you have to go to room number three. If you're in room number three, you have to go to room number four, and so on and so on and so on. And the manager can do this because every individual guest is in a finite room number, and if every guest is in a finite room number, there will always exist a room which is one higher than that finite number because we have an infinity of rooms. So every single guest will be able to move up one, and then that will cause room number one, the lowest room, to be vacant, and that is the room that the new guest can go into. Um, so what's going to be helpful now, this will come up in the later parts of the video, is to write this in sort of a more formal mathematical way. So what the manager is doing is he's doing an operation here. He's saying the, the, um, the person in room n is moving to room n plus 1. So here n is any natural number, it represents any room, and the operation here represented by this arrow says the, the guest in room n moves to room n plus 1. And by this operation the manager can always make room for a new guest. And in fact what you should probably be able to see at this stage is that this will work for any finite number of rooms. So if a hundred guests arrive, the manager can say every guest must move to a new room which is equal to their current room number plus 100. And because this, um, this hotel is infinite, then we can always shift a guest up a finite number of rooms because for every uh, room there is, there will always be um, every room will be a finite number, and there will always be another finite number which is 1 or 2 or 10 or a thousand greater than it. So by means of this operation, the manager can easily make room for a finite number of guests at the hotel. So even though Hilbert had a fully occupied hotel with an infinite number of guests, he can always make room for more. So now the question naturally arises, how far can we really push this logic? Is there a number of guests that can arrive which Hilbert will be unable to accommodate in his hotel? And that's exactly what we're going to look at next with Hilbert's bus. Now, here's a bigger problem for Hilbert because one day a bus arrives and just like Hilbert's hotel, this bus has an infinite number of seats and they're labelled as the natural numbers. And every single seat in this bus is occupied with a passenger, and every single passenger would like a room at Hilbert's already fully occupied hotel. And the question is, is there a way that the manager can shift the guests around um, in order to accommodate this new infinity of guests in the bus? Now, certainly at first, it doesn't appear that the manager's hopes of being able to accommodate all these new guests are particularly good. Um, the manager can't do the same thing he did last time, because if he's trying to get each current guest to shift up a certain number of rooms, he will have to ask each guest to shift up an infinite number of rooms. And that's just simply not something that is definable. If I'm in room two and I get told to move to room two plus infinity, I have no idea where I'm going. It doesn't work. 
So is there a way, a clever way, that the manager can move around the guests and can accommodate this new infinity of passengers in Hilbert's bus? This would be a good point if you want to have a think about this yourself to pause the video and then we'll come back and we'll do the, the solution. Right, so there is a way that the manager can accommodate these new guests and this is how they do it. So first, the manager issues an instruction over the loudspeaker to all the current guests in his hotel. And he says, will the guest in room N, so again, remember, N stands for any arbitrary um, natural number. So the guest in room N, will they please move to room 2N? So each guest has to move to a room with a room number two times the room they are currently in. So if I'm in room two, I move to room four. If I'm in room 20, I move to room 40. If I'm in room 1000, I move to room 2000. And what you'll notice is that when we take any natural number n and we multiply it by two, we always end up with an even number. So by means of this operation here, Hilbert can free up all the odd numbered rooms in his hotel because every single guest is now moving to a determined room so it's not indetermined, like when we say move up an infinity of rooms, that's not happening. We know exactly where every guest is going and every guest will end up in an even room number. So that's step number one. We've now freed up all the odd numbered rooms. And the second and final step is that the manager says, will the bus passenger in seat S, so again, S is any arbitrary natural number corresponding to each seat in the bus, will the passenger in seat S please go to room 2s minus 1. So what do we see here? We see that, well, when we take any arbitrary natural number s, if we multiply it by 2, we get an even number. And then if we subtract 1 from that, we always get an odd number. So every single seat passenger here will get a different odd numbered room which they can move into. If I'm in seat number 1, I end up in room two multiplied by one, which is two minus one, I end up in room one. If I'm in seat two, I end up in room three. So just like this, every single passenger in the bus gets a defined odd numbered room and every single original uh, guest in the hotel gets a defined even numbered room. And now once again, the hotel is fully occupied, but this time Hilbert has managed to accommodate not only the pre-existing infinity of guests, but also this new infinity of bus passengers. So things are going to get more complicated still for Hilbert though, as we next are going to look at Hilbert's train. So next, Hilbert's train arrives and Hilbert's train works like this. There are an infinite number of carts on this train and within each and every cart, there are an infinite number of seats. And of course, every seat in every cart is occupied. And the question is, can the manager accommodate this now much larger infinity of guests in the already fully occupied hotel? So whereas before the bus just had an infinity of seats, we now have an infinity of carts and an infinity of seats. So we have almost an infinity times infinity. It's much, much larger. Um, so is there a way the manager can accommodate all these new guests? Well, pause the video here if you want to have a go for yourself. Um, but if not, then there is a way for the manager to accommodate all these new guests. And this is how the manager's going to do it. So to start with, the manager does exactly the same step as in the previous example with the bus. He gets the guest currently residing in room N to move to room 2N. So like that, he has put all the current guests into the even numbered rooms of the hotel, and he has vacated all the odd numbered rooms of the hotel. And then the manager issues this statement to all the passengers in the, um, in the train. He says, will the passenger who is currently sitting in cart number C, so C, any um, arbitrary natural number representing the cart, with the passenger sitting in cart C and in seat number S within the cart, please move to room number three, to the power of C multiplied by five to the power of S. Now, let's go through this a little slower because I appreciate this is more complicated than the last example we did. Um, what do we have here? Well, um, 
Three and five, you probably know, are both prime numbers. And what do we know about prime numbers? Well, um, one property of prime numbers is the so-called uniqueness of the prime factorization. So what that means is that every product of prime numbers, three times three times five times seven, um, whatever it is, every product of prime numbers has a unique answer to it. So you cannot take two different products of prime numbers and have them equal the same number. Because, well, primes, you can kind of think of them like the building blocks of all the other numbers. There's only one way to get each number um, from, from multiplying all the primes together. So every single passenger in the train is defined by two numbers, the cart they're in, C, and the seat they're in, S. And we take those two numbers which define every single passenger in the train, and we use them as the powers in these uh, prime numbers here. So if I'm sitting in cart number two and seat number two, then I would be in room three to the power two multiplied by five to the power two, which is equal to three times three times five times five. And this is equal to, I really should have prepared this, 25 times nine is 225, I think. Um, right, so because of the uniqueness of the prime factorization, and because three and five are odd numbers, and every odd number to any power is an odd number, and any product of odd numbers is always an odd number, then that means that every single uh, passenger in the train will be given a unique odd numbered room. So just as before, what the manager has cleverly done is put all the current guests in the even rooms and given a unique odd numbered room to every single passenger in the train. And just like that, the manager is able to accommodate this new infinity of infinities of passengers. Um, but where we're really going with this, and what we're gonna see in the next part of this video is where this logic breaks down. How many passengers need to arrive for Hilbert to no longer be able to accommodate them in his hotel? And that's what we're gonna cover next. So, we've now looked at two different examples, Hilbert's bus and Hilbert's train. But what's actually going on here? What are we actually looking at when we're doing these examples? Well, what these examples neatly illustrate is a very fundamental concept in mathematics. It's a concept called equinumerosity. And when we say that two different sets are equinumerous, that means that the members of those two different sets can be placed in a one-to-one -one correspondence with one another. That is, we can assign a, a member of one set to a member of the other set, and every single member of both of these sets can be given a unique partner in the other set. And that's what we mean when we say that two sets are equinumerous. Um, so what are these examples actually doing? Well, the hotel is labeled like the natural numbers. So this hotel represents the natural numbers, the set of natural numbers in maths. And then the bus also represents the set of natural numbers. Um, and the train car actually represents the set of rational numbers. And what we found is that the rational numbers, the set of the train car passengers, is equinumerous with the natural numbers. So in some sense, the infinity of the natural numbers is the same as the infinity of the rational numbers. Um, now, I said that the train represents the rational numbers. Um, why is that? Well, um, the definition of a rational number, any rational number, let's just call it R, um, can be defined as um, the, the division of one integer A by another integer B. So this is what defines the set of the rational numbers. And you can see here, that for any two integers a and b, by putting a and b as the power to these two primes, we can give every rational number a unique room in the hotel. Or, to put it in more formal language, we can assign every member of the set of rational numbers to a member of the set of natural numbers. And so we can say that the natural numbers are equinumerous with the rational numbers. But, what is really startling here is that it turns out that there is a set of numbers which is not equinumerous with the set 
of natural numbers. And that is the set of irrational numbers. So rational numbers, like we said, are any two integers, one divided by the other, whereas irrational numbers is a number which cannot be expressed in this way. It cannot be expressed as the division of two integers. And it turns out that there is literally no way for the hotel manager to accommodate all the passengers with each passenger represented by an irrational number. There is literally no operation, there is no way that the manager can manipulate the guests and assign um, new guests to rooms in a way that will accommodate all the new guests. So what does this mean? Well, it means that if we're talking about so natural numbers already form an infinite set of numbers, right? There's already infinity of them. And rational numbers have a similar type of infinity to them because we found that for every, um, for every natural number, we can assign a unique rational number and we can do this for every single rational number there is. They're equinumerous. But with irrational numbers, the infinity of the irrational numbers is so vast, it's so non-algebraic, in that we can't define irrational numbers with um, sequences of integers like this and then use prime factorizations like we did before. There are so, so many of them in this infinity that this infinity is infinitely larger than the infinity of the rationals and the infinity of the natural numbers. Between any two natural numbers, between the natural number which is 10 to the power minus 23 and 10 to the power minus 23.1, or whatever tiny, tiny increment we're moving from one rational to the next, an infinitesimal space we're moving through, there is an infinity of irrational numbers between those two rationals that is infinitely larger than the entire infinity of the rationals, but, but than the entire infinity of the natural numbers. We have an infinity here which is infinitely greater than the infinity we had before. And that is the key takeaway from this, that not all infinities are equal. There are in fact an infinite number of different infinities, some of which are equinumerous with other infinities, but most of which are not equinumerous with other infinities. And we can, in a way, grade our infinities by size in this respect. It's a very, very unusual um, result. It's a very, very counterintuitive result because after all, infinity is already, well, infinite. Um, but there we have it. There's, there is no way of somehow manipulating the infinity of the irrationals to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with the infinity of the natural numbers. And that is a beautiful and surprising piece of maths. Um, so that's really it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think equinumerosity is such a lovely subject, so I would encourage you to go away and look at any other videos um, around that because it throws up such a vast number of different paradoxes. It's really great. Um, and one of my favorite paradoxes, which I'll just talk you through very briefly, was I think identified originally by um, Galileo, who obviously very famous physicist mathematician. Um, and he said that if you take two lines, and if we have one line shorter than the other, then he said that what we can actually do is take every single point on the longer line and assign it to a point on the shorter line. And every single point will have a different assignment of numbers on the shorter line. And Galileo's response to this is that this demonstrates that the concept of infinity is fundamentally flawed because there must be more points in the longer line than in the shorter line, and yet we can assign every point in the longer line to a unique point in the shorter line. And his argument was, this means that the concept of infinity breaks down in continuous systems. But really, now that we've seen what we have with equinumerosity and all of Hilbert's work, what we can just say is that there actually are an infinity of points in both sides, but these infinities are equinumerous. There is a one-to-one -one mapping of all these points. So there isn't really a contradiction there. Rather, it is just another fascinating and unintuitive aspect of infinity. So yeah, like I say, go away, look up these concepts, look up Hilbert's work, look up Galileo's paradoxes. There's so much great stuff. I really hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you soon.